call to order. It's uh, Monday, September 24th, 7.07 p.m. This is the school board meeting in St. Louis Park. Our agenda includes um, the approval of, of the agenda, open forum. There is no one here to address the board. The superintendent's report. Our discussion items include A, summer school update, B, WEMAP resolution relating to dissolution of West Metro Education Program. I would like to remove that from the agenda because I learned on Friday at 4.30 that records that we had understood to be ready for destruction um, are not ready for destruction according to both the Attorney General's office and the State Auditor's office. So the WEMAP Board of Directors is gonna have to convene and discuss what to do about those 70 boxes of records that need a longer amount of attention at a particular cost. Item C, the preliminary of the 2018 levy payable in 2019. Item D, policy development first reading policies 414, mandated reporting of child neglect or physical or sexual abuse. And 415, mandated reporting of maltreatment of vulnerable adults. Item E, policy development second reading 410 medical, family medical and 413 harassment and violence. Uh, we have the consent agenda, the action agenda, um, communications and transmittals, and adjournment. Is there a motion to approve the agenda, removing item B? Moved by Jim Benneke. Is there a second? Second by Ken Morrison. All those in favor say aye. Aye. That carries 7 0. Um, and yes, with that, we're removing uh, item D from the action agenda. That's correct, Joe. Thank you for pointing that out. Okay, so now we will head into our superintendent's report. There is no one here for open forum. All right, good evening, Chair Waters, members of the board. This evening for my superintendent's report, I would like to share some informational items connected to our strategic priorities. Last week um, was homecoming week and we had an action-packed week full of events and activities that brought the community together. Um, on Friday, um, our community celebrated with the homecoming parade at that evening and also the football game, which the Orioles came out victorious, 41-14 over Richfield. So it's always nice to have a homecoming and end and with a win that, during that game. The high school facilities improvements took another step forward this week as the district hosted a neighborhood meeting on Thursday, September 20th. Um, this meeting was held as part of our conditional use permit process required by the City of St. Louis Park. Um, construction will begin um, tentatively in March of 19 after the Planning Commission has a chance to review these plans and then finally approved, once it's approved, excuse me, by the City Council. Um, lastly, I would like to just take a moment to acknowledge um, students in our school-run newspaper at the high school, The Echo. Um, they've been named one of 67 National Peacemaker finalists by the National Scholastic Press Association for 2018. The National Peacemaker is the highest award that the NSPA gives. Um, the 67 Peacemaker finalists represent states and, um, and I mean, it's 24 states in the U.S. and England. Um, and the Echo is the only Minnesota-based newspaper or magazine on this list. And that concludes my report for this evening. Thank you very much. Our next item is the summer school update to be presented by Lisa Green, Director of Community Education. Good evening, Chair Waters, members of the board, Superintendent Osai. Um, I'm here to present a, a recap of our summer programs. And first of all, I just want to be clear that I don't run these programs. I'm what we call the consolidator in the district to make sure that every program has a place to be and I just tell you what's happening and that kind of thing. So 
Um, as we move forward, um, the information I have is what was sent to me from the people who are running it. If you have further questions that I can't answer, I am prepared to write them down and get back to you on that. So I just wanted to let you know that. Um, I also want to let you know, too, that I have added a couple of slides because I wanted to establish some of the, um, the general research around summer programs and why they're important. So first, and I, I apologize for how small this uh, type is, but what I did was I literally just copied this from the um, 2016 State Approved Alternative, uh, Alternative Programs Resource Guide from the Department of Ed, from Minnesota Department of Ed. And this is uh, from a page about targeted services and, and why it's important that we offer summer programming. Uh, so it says that students typically score lower on standardized tests at the end of summer vacation than they do on the same test at the beginning of the summer. Uh, students lose about two-thirds of grade level equivalency in mathematical computation skill over the summer months. And this next sentence, um, I think, is really starting to hit some really important points. Uh, Low-income students also lose more than two months in reading achievement, despite the fact that their middle-class peers may make slight gains. About two-thirds of the ninth grade achievement gap between lower and higher income youth can be explained by unequal access to summer learning opportunities during the elementary school years. Um, Prachi and I were talking about this a uh, little bit this afternoon, and one of her colleagues calls it the resource faucet. And who has the resources, who can um, use resources in the summer to ensure that their children are getting, you know, camp and educational opportunities and that kind of thing, and who can't? And um, so I think um, uh, as I go forward, a number of our programs um, we strive to make free for students. So we want to make sure that that resource gap um, is less. Um, it's a health and wellness issue. Uh, children who are not actively engaged in activities in the summer can gain weight. And lastly, parents consistently cite summer as the most difficult time to ensure that their children have productive things to do. Um, now, uh, for eight years, I ran out of school time a 21st century a community, uh, 21st century community learning center, and targeted services in the Osseo School District. So I had a lot of professional development around why up around the benefits of out of school time programs, and this means um, you know summer and also after school programs, Saturday, you know anything that's outside of the regular school day. But this I tried to kind of hone in specifically on summer. Uh, the benefits of out-of-school time are that can reduce summer learning loss. And while we don't know what would happen if they didn't come, um, but it, we know that probably there, there, are, there would be some summer learning loss for sure if they didn't come. Uh, in addressing the whole child, uh, the social emotional development, and actually uh, in like 21st century grant requirements and targeted services, we are required to address the social and emotional development of the child in addition to academic development and other types of things. And um, that it means it can uh, play out like in improved relationships with their peers and with their teachers uh, because the atmosphere in an out of school time program, it's typically there's a lower teacher to student ratio, it's a more relaxed atmosphere, it doesn't feel so high stakes. and um, and so relationships can get built. And as, as a matter of fact, one of the things that uh, comes through uh, over and over again when I get um, the anecdotal information from the middle school is that teachers um, uh, report that students that they might have been having trouble with during the school year, they've kind of worked that out during the summer and they've developed a relationship. So that can only be beneficial as you go into the next year and as the student feels more connection with that teacher and with other teachers. Um, uh, due to the skill building that uh, can happen in summer, uh, students report in improved self-esteem. There's an increased engagement to school. If they're engaged in activities that they like that are attached to school, they feel more engaged. Um, that can uh, translate into uh, improved grades and uh, graduation rates as students want to come to school and want to try. Uh, I mentioned before the health and wellness. Uh, during the summer, we do provide two meals a day for students and they are active. It, um, in all of our programs, uh, they get outside, they're active, they 
do things in addition to classroom type activities. And this is, it is a safe space for children to be who might not, who might just be at home alone or um, you know, otherwise you know, not uh, supervised. So now moving forward, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, our different pro uh, programs that we had this summer. Of course, we had our uh, elementary summer learning academy at Aquila for five weeks. Average weekly attendance was 202. And if you're wondering uh, how that compares to years in the past, yes, that is down uh, from years in the past. And as I've, just, as I've been thinking about this, I think we, uh, you know, based on everything that I just said, I think we need to think um, about how we recruit students. If we were only recruiting students based on their academic achievement at the time, like in the spring, well, we're not taking into uh, account any summer learning loss that they might have. So we should be looking at students who um, might be on the cusp, who might be, you know, who could benefit from being, uh, having that five extra weeks of school, even if they are on, um, on grade level right now and also um, thinking about their social and emotional well-being and um, being in a program, um, how that might be helpful to them. Average breakfast and lunch um, was, uh, looks like quite a bit less, but um, every day 60 to 75 students went to Central for lunch. Uh, so we had uh, 60 summer learning and play students, and I'll talk about that in a little bit that went over to Central and, and anywhere from five to 15 students uh, that went over to Kids Place for lunch at Central. So you take those out of the mix and now we're getting closer to pretty much serving every student who was at uh, Aquila. Uh, the teachers provide pre and post tests and they also, uh, every student is required to have a continual learning plan or a CLP. And so the teachers use those, that's from the referring teacher, and they develop their pre and post tests for the students. They use them um, to like provide instruction to, so they know uh, they can indiv individualize instruction for students. Um, and I did find out that, um, that in the elementary school, for, ev uh, for the students who did take both the pre and the post test, depending on the teacher, 75 to 100 percent either had showed minor improvement or stayed the same. Um, an exciting thing that happened this summer is the Sheridan Story uh, food bags. Um, they, every, every family, every student got uh, a bag provided for them every weekend. So we do thank the Sheridan Story for that uh, wonderful opportunity for our kids. Another thing too, uh, for the first time this year, attendance was entered into power school. And the benefit of that is that um, uh, when, uh, if a student is absent, an automatic phone call goes home to remind them that, it was, you know, that we noticed your child was missing today. Hopefully your child will be here tomorrow. And then uh, we did have a pre-K program there. There were 12 students in that program. We had one section. And you know, every year I can report the same thing. I go on the first day, there's always that one little you know, four or five-year-old, probably a five-year-old, because they'll be going in the kindergarten um, in the fall, uh, who is scared, is crying, does not want to join the group, needs a lot of coaxing. And then I go the next week, and that student is just right in with the rest of them. So I, it's just so fun to see how they grow so quickly. Uh, and get so used to being in that school environment. At the middle school, again, a, a five-week program, their average weekly attendance was 100. Again, their attendance was entered into power school. And you can see their numbers um, were, you know, didn't come up to the 100 for lunch, so, uh, so still not every child is choosing to eat school lunch. Um, I did provide in your packets uh, information of, in, from um, the coordinators for the uh, elementary, Mike Nordine and Lil Zumberg for middle school. Uh, Lil uh, provided a lot of uh, anecdotal information about things that were happening at the middle school. Um, but one thing that we did do again this year is we had the Courageous Students Initiative for students of color. Um, about 20 each day per, uh, participated in that and they were able to go out in the community and do things with the police and have other types of field trips. So it was a, it was a great experience for them. And at the high school, we have Credit Recovery and Play-Doh, which is our independent study. Uh, there the average weekly attendance is 100 to 150. Um, and uh, 
Omar Adams, who was the coordinator for that program this summer, was really working with the students this year to um, engage them and get them to come every day. Uh, these are high school students. Uh, they, um, they're anywhere from ninth through, you know, having just gone through uh, being a senior and need credit. And so they, they need to make that up. If they're in ninth grade and they're a credit short, that'll follow them all the way if they don't make that up. And, uh, and of course, if, you're, if a senior has, um, you know, wants to graduate, they need to, um, they need to make up that credit. And so one um, a story that Omar had was that he did have a, a very reluctant student who um, was short credits and uh, couldn't graduate, but you know, he just stayed in and he got his credits and um, he really felt a great feeling of pride knowing that he could actually graduate from high school. Now community education, summer learning and play program. Um, we have our morning and afternoon camps. And what we did this year, and this was due to popular demand, we've been asked to do this for several years, and so this year we did it. We um, had, what we did was we bused students from Aquila. Uh, these were, any student who went to Aquila in the morning and the middle school was eligible to take a free afternoon camp. Um, and so what we did was we um, took all of our vendor camps, which we can't use for targeted services anyway, and we put those in the morning. So this, the paying students um, took those. And then in the afternoon, we had our teacher taught classes, and those we can use for targeted services. And they were open for the students from Aquila to take for free, and they were open for paying students. So everybody came together uh, to take classes in the afternoon. And we had 60 uh, students whose um, parents chose to sign them up from uh, Aquila to come over on the bus to Central. And then at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, we had a bus home. And, um, and so we're hoping that we can grow that next year. But I will tell you, um, in addition to the cost of the bus, which is not inexpensive, as you know, we have to really staff up for a program like that. Um, there's a lot of moving parts. And keeping kids safe is, our, uh, is of utmost priority for us. So we have to have people go over to Aquila and make sure that all of the students who are supposed to be on that bus to Central are on that bus. And we want to make sure that a student doesn't go home who's supposed to be going over to Central and that kind of thing. So, and then we have to have um, staff ride the bus home because we started off with only one bus, but that was like such a long bus ride that we had to get another bus. And so the students are on the bus, some of them for 45 minutes, and going into Minneapolis at rush hour, sometimes an hour. So we have to have staff on the bus because they can, that's a long day. <laughs> and that's at the end of a long day for them. And of course, Kids Place, our, our granddaddy of summer programming. Um, now at Kids Place, we had 404 average daily attendance, 535 students had registered. Uh, but of course, people take a lot of vacations and things in the summer. Now our lunch counts here are really low and I would, um, I'm gonna have to talk with Tammy about that because uh, I know this year one thing they did do was um, they actually made bag lunches for the students who were going on field trips because that was something they didn't do last year. So we were able to take bag lunches on our field trips so I would have thought that would have brought our lunch count up higher so um, I'm not sure why that's so low. I do think that after working here for a few years and talking to my colleagues who are also parents, there is sort of a culture here of bringing your lunch. And I think that goes through the summer too. Um, I don't know what it is, but a lot of um, families choose to send um, their child to school with lunch. So, uh, but of course, Kids Place, as you know, has just tons of activities. Uh, keep, keeping kids busy, and I know I've uh, always appreciated the support of uh, of school board members who have kids in Kids Place, and now, of course, our superintendent does too, and, um, and you know, just how much the kids love it, and they, uh, they love being there, and because it is fun, and it's so engaging, and the staff is so wonderful. But this year, they wanted me to highlight their Kids Place fashion show that they do every year, and it gives students a chance to be creative. They create their costumes, boys and girls. Um, they can do anything they want. They can wear Halloween costumes. Just Halloween or a fancy dress or whatever they want or their sports uniform. Uh, it just has to be appropriate. 
But then they get up and they walk the runway. And, um, and then they, so every child then gets a chance to be in front of the audience and having their peers, you know, it, you know urge them on and that kind of thing. It's just a, it's a wonderful event. I've been to it a couple times, it's really fun. So then at PSI, we had our open library program and um, a number of families uh, take advantage of that. They are allowed to check out as many books as they want and then there's a lot of repeat customers at our open library program at PSI. Uh, of course, Peter Hobart um, sent teachers again to basketball in the park on Thursday nights at Ainsworth Park. And I just wanna kinda take it back to that relationship building. Uh, when you think about it, I mean, they, if they're doing math, they're doing math activities with families at Ainsworth Park. Just say that's one of the things that they're doing. You know, that's not gonna take a student who's two grades behind in math to, you know, two grades ahead in math or anything like that. But what it might do is it might get them to think, wow, math can be fun if it's taught to me this different way. I think I might like math. Oh, I really like my teacher. Wow, those teachers must really care about me because they came up here, so the relationship building. Um, and so I think that's one of the huge benefits of that program. And uh, then, of course, we had uh, Peter Hobart teachers go to Perspectives and tutor kids. And um, I, I was meeting with somebody from Perspectives last week about something completely different. But um, I asked her about the uh, tutoring program, and she said that it's marvelous. The kids just love it when the teachers come over and they work with the kids one-on-one, -on -one and Perspectives really appreciates that program. And, of course, we had our community education enrichment programs. So summer 2019, the next couple summers are gonna be a little bit rough because we are having, you know, we're under, gonna be under a lot of construction. 2019, I think we're gonna just kind of squeeze through with having enough space for all of our programs, but we are meeting on October 2nd. It's a really important meeting because we have got to figure out where all of these programs are going to be next summer. And then summer 2020, hmm, that might be even a little more, uh, a little bit more rough because um, I believe uh, we might have some of our secondary buildings down. So uh, we'll just have to keep working that. It's, uh, we, we do feel that summer programs are important and we um, are working very hard just to make sure that we can maintain that presence. And that's all I have. Anybody have any questions? Well, it all sounds quite wonderful and exciting, and, and I don't know if you can answer this or not, but I was struck by uh, the fact that by using PowerSchool, there's an automatic call if somebody doesn't show up the next day, and I, or, or there's a call. What I don't know is, is that an automated call, or is that a person that actually calls the home and says, oh, you weren't here, we missed you, we want you. I believe it's automated, and one of the problems is that they just didn't have enough staff to make all those phone calls, so automating it then made it so we could do that. Otherwise, it was too hard to have staff to do that. And then, Aston, I don't know if you know the answer, but I'm curious about what we do during the regular school year about attendance and whether we use power school in that way to call kids, say, we miss you, we want you here, because absences really make a difference in terms of um, academic performance. Um, I do know we have an automated system that calls out to notify parents or guardians that a child is absent. Um, I'm, the way you framed it in a positive tone, um, you know, I don't, I, I'm not sure if the message is communicated that way, but I certainly am receiving the feedback around how that positive tone has a um, good response for families. Yeah, I, I, I've received some of those. So um, <laughs> it's, it's um, just uh, your kid was marked absence or your kid was marked tardy. And that was it, pretty much. Uh, normal yearly plug for summer kids' place. <laughs> My kids love it. It's great. Uh, staff is amazing. Takes them on so many different field trips. I don't know how they can keep up with them day in and day out, but they do, and they do a fantastic job. That staff is so energetic over there. It's just, yeah. <laughs> the other thing that I think is important to let the community know, the programs are accredited. So it's not just what we think is worthwhile, it's been vetted by, um, I can't think of the acronym Oh, uh, There's NACI. Um, that's the preschool, and of course, we're four star parent aware rated in all of our preschool programs. And uh, oh, I'm drawing a blank on the, uh, the school age care. There's, we're also accredited for that, too. 
Lisa, thank you so much. We appreciate your presentation. Thank you. And now next up, um, Superintendent Osai will lead us through the preliminary 2018 levy payable 2019 discussion. Thank you, Superintendent Osai. Chair Waters, members of the board, this evening I will be presenting the preliminary 2018 levy payable in 2019 on behalf of our um, new director of business services, Patricia Magnuson, who um, has not started yet and couldn't be here this evening, and our current assistant director of business services, uh, Brooke Grossinger. Um, so wh where I would like to first start is with the comparison of the preliminary levy to the final payable levy in 2018. And what you will notice is that the levy has been broke, this comparison has been broken down into three fund categories, the general fund, community service fund, and debt services fund. And I'll um, go a little bit deeper in each of these areas here shortly. But w the, the key takeaway that I want um, you to notice from this slide is the, the change in the overall amount from um, 18 compared to the payable amount, preliminary payable amount in 2019, and that is the 445, 370, um, thousand dollars, um, which is a 1.4% um, change. Um, it's, it's also important to note and just remind um, anyone watching that this levy is for taxes payable in 2019, um, establishing property tax revenue for the 1920 fiscal year. So as I mentioned uh, a little while ago, we'll go a little bit deeper in each fund area. And as we look at the general fund, there are essentially three major, um, there are three areas that account for the majority of the increase. And one of those is the operating referendum that you'll notice on this slide. And that increases due to the inflationary factor. Um, another area um, that contributed to the increase was the capital projects referendum which is set at a tax rate against a growing tax capacity and then the third area that um, contributed to the increase that that 1.4 increase that i mentioned on the previous slide um, is the is the building lease levy um, and as you all know as part of our bond referendum project and all of the projects that we're doing here in the st louis park public school district that we um, entered into a new lease moving the district office out of the high school for a temporary period of time so that we can do construction here at the high school and um, start to um, turn over some of those offices, turn them into classrooms, and, and move forward with those construction projects. Um, so with the actual general fund levy, those with those three areas that I described, um, contributed to a $625,584,000 increase, um, or 3.1%. The next area is the community service fund. Um, and in this area, the, the overall increase was $2,024 or a 0.2% increase. And it's important to note that as we, as we think about, as you look at this area and you look at the notes section down below that um, all of one um, area under the community service fund are based on an equalized formula and you know under levying could result in the loss of state aid and essentially what the equalization formula is is a cost sharing formula that state and local districts each contribute a portion to the total cost um, i also want to mention here that the school board can reduce the total um, dollar levy following the tax hearing on december 10th um, but it's also important to note that um, we, we can't increase it. So my hope and my final recommendation, recommendation today will be that we, um, that you as a school board approve the levy at the maximum, knowing that we have an opportunity later to, to reduce that if needed. The last area that I would like to um, share um, is the debt services fund. And the debt services fund is decreasing by $182,238 or negative 1.7%. Um, and again, as I, as I mentioned previously, um, this evening I'm recommending that the school board approve the preliminary levy at the maximum to allow maximum flexibility for staff to continue to work with MD, MDE through September 30th, um, and that the school board can make a final decision regarding the levy in December. So do you have any questions for me at this time? Yep. So I just want to point out to the community, um, as I was driving in tonight, Public Radio had a report about um, what has been happening at the state with 
the per pupil funding, which is the biggest chunk of our budget, and it has been flat and not holding pace with inflation since 2003. And so what people need to understand, the, the levy component where we're asking property owners to uh, fill in the hole, that's been happening since 2003. We appreciate that our community is doing that for us. Um, the, the burden comes from the state and the federal government imposing unfunded mandates upon all school districts in Minnesota. And, and we are reaching a critical point where some communities just cannot levy to the same capacity as other communities. And in our state, we actually have within the Constitution that all students in Minnesota deserve and have the right to an effective public education. And so um, as we move forward, we really are going to need our state legislators working on behalf of all of us to improve the per pupil rate. Um, and the study that came out today said, you know, 2019, 2020, just in order to get back to filling in the hole to the 2003 levels, it's gonna have to be 3%, 3% on the formula. And, and we're talking for 2019, 2020 to get back to the 2003 standards. So um, you, you do have people in the political arena saying that we already pay an awful lot in taxes for education. Well, that's not actually necessarily true. And, and at the same token, we have enormous expenses related to special ed. Our cross subsidy is uh, 4.8 million and growing. Other districts have the same issue. So um, this is important information. I, I think it's um, important that people in the community understand we're not doing this because this is paying for frills. This is paying for all of the basics. And we would invite the community to contact their legislators to discuss this issue. So Aston, just back, back to what we're looking at here, and I see it up there, the analysis of preliminary levy. What, what's been recommended is that we, that we approve the maximum. We can adjust it down later if we want. And that, that number is about $445,000 more, and that's a 1.4% increase in the current levy absolutely okay. and as i thank you for the question and the clarification and um as i referenced before um it's important to note that the the increase really is coming out of three areas that being the operating levy the capital projects referendum and the, the building lease levy thank you thank you very much superintendent osai now we're going to go on to item D, policy development, first reading policies 414, mandated reporting of child neglect or physical or sexual abuse, and 415, mandated reporting of maltreatment of vulnerable adults. Um, so you did receive these in your packets, and um, let's hear the discussion. Thank you, Chair Waters and the members of the board. Just for your information, this last was reviewed in 2016, and MSBA has no further updates since 2016. Thank you very much. That'd be policy four, I'm referring right now to 414. And actually the same applies for 415. The school district just approved as a new policy in March of this year, 2018. We added this policy and there are no, no new updates from MSBA at this time for 415 either. Thank you, Cindy. Any questions from my colleagues on these two policies?
I just wanted to, I was just looking at the dates. I wanted to make sure that it was clear that these um, are both annual review policies. So we're, we're behind on one of them, but we're catching up. And they both do appear on our, um, on our new handy uh, worksheet of annual review or policy review at cycle. So we'll see these again in another year. That's correct. Thank you so much, Anne, for pointing that out. All right. Um, if there are no other comments regarding those two policies, we can move on to the policy development, second reading, 410 family medical leave and 413 harassment and violence. Cindy. Thank you again, Chair Waters. This is a second reading for these two policies, 410 family medical leave and 413 harassment and violence. I did make the edits and suggestions that were made at the last meeting when this policies were presented for first reading. And you have in front of you uh, friendly edits from Director Casey that came in today for your consideration on 410. And I apologize for the lateness of that. I had, um, I was at the open house at the middle school on Thursday and a teacher was talking about the work that she had done to um, change her welcome letter to conform with the gender inclusion policy. And I knew, I think last week, you know, we talked about this, it was just last week? <laughs> last was. week we talked about this policy and we kind of, you know, I think I even said, well, we just reviewed this in 2018 already, but we have a new policy on our books since then. And that new policy says that all of our policies need to conform with it. <laughs> So I thought, I wonder if it does. Um, and, I, and I looked through it, and I, and I just made, um, I think, Cindy, thank you for saying friendly suggestions um, to get this policy to conform with our gender inclusion policy. I'd love to hear your, your thoughts and feedback on whether this is necessary or what you think. Yeah, and I just, um, I took a look through it, and so my first thought is um, all of the changes that you made, I did not, I was fine with except uh, the one in I, because I don't think, I, I think that as, as it currently exists for me is just fine. Um, and I've been with folks who say, you know, um, this is my husband, a male referring to his male, and so I, I don't think that's gender limited there, personally. So your other changes that I see here, uh, personally, I don't think they change the meaning of the law, I think they do make it more, um, uh, uh, they make it better by getting rid of the gender uh, links when they're not needed, and I don't think they change the meaning. I, uh, I, and, I and I'm gonna guess that Cindy's gonna tell me this is exactly as the MSBA recommends it, but, but I am, but, if, but one thing that struck me as I looked at this, and I've adopted it a lot as we've approved it over the time, is it, it's interesting to me that in terms of the general statement of the policy, what we don't say at the beginning of that is, it is the policy of this district to follow the FMLA and the Minnesota Parenting Leave Laws, and then go on to say everything else that we say. But we don't have a clear, as clear a statement as I would think the MSBA should be recommending that we're gonna follow the law. And so that's just that was just my kind of if there was some concern that the edits were changing the law, if we added that, it seems to me that we're being clear that we're not changing the law, we're just, we're just doing the edit that the Congress is never gonna get around to because they can't agree on much of anything. Nancy, you are correct. This is verbatim out of MSBA, and, and as you know, Michelle Kenny is an author for MSBA for these policies. The section that you're referring to that you would like to remain as is I, that was just added, new from MSBA in 2016. I did take this, um, these friendly edits down to Human Resources and spoke to Director Cryer. And if he'd like to add anything now, that would be great. Sure, thanks. Um, yeah, what MSBA did for the most part is to go out to FMLA and to the Uniform Services Act, which also has some provisions about time off for service members. Uh, a little extra time for service members and use the language they use. Uh, for example, it'll say brothers, sisters. Um, it'll have a definition, son or daughter means biological, adopted, foster child, stepchild, ward, 
legal ward or child of a person standing in local parentis who is either under the age of 18 or age 18 and older and incapable of self-care because, you know. So um, the one thing I, Again, we can administer this as a human resource department if it says siblings or if it says child. Um, we would go back to the law and administer it the way. Um, there is, in our policy, no definition of child. Uh, so if we refer to child, the, you know, you'd say, well, what's a child? And so we would then go back to F, uh, FMLA for that. Um, the one thing I would find is I, you know, when I look at FMLA under I, uh, they actually use the term spouse. They don't use the term husband or wife. So that friendly amendment would actually conform to what the FMLA talks about. Um, so I, I wouldn't, I, I, you know, I don't have any difficulty um, accepting any of the friendly amendments. Those are just notions. Um, the one last piece is, uh, like you mentioned, uh, Member Gores, um, I, I believe our policy is to follow the law. Now, if what the board is doing is then paraphrasing, what does that mean for people who don't go out to the, you know, U.S. Constitution and look at, you know, the Family Medical Leave Act? Here's some of what it says. You know, it may be wise to phrase that as, you know, uh, you know, uh, specific provisions will be generally described below. You know, which means that as the FMLA law updates itself, um, we would obviously pick up those updates even if it wasn't picked up in our policy. So those are just thoughts. Actually, you've, you've persuaded me on IREC that the change is just fine. Um, I am wondering though, this is our second read, I am just wondering if we should have a third reading, talk about, think about adding that it is the policy, but look at what our other policies say so we're, we're using some parallel construction and how we phrase that. And I don't know, Rick, you don't think we need to run this by Michelle Kenny? Because I don't think we're changing the substance of the MFLA if we add that other tag language. Um, since Michelle wrote it, she may say, what, edit my lines? But uh, <laughs> yeah, who knows? Um, I'm also uh, in agreement with all the changes and I'm, uh, I thank Ann for picking up on this and I think that this is going to be one of our challenges as we continue to review policies over the next couple of years is, you know, I for one kind of had my employment lawyer hat on when I was reading this policy um, and I knew it conformed with the FMLA and so I knew I wasn't going to be challenging any of the provisions. I wasn't looking at it under the context of our gender inclusion policy. And so I would really challenge us to just be attentive to that um, in our, all of our policies moving forward. And at the risk of doing a find and replace on all of our policies for son or daughter or boy or girl or male or female, um, we are going to have to um, attend to this. So thanks so much, Anne, for finding it and picking up on it and making these suggestions. I think they're totally appropriate. And I also like the idea of um, Nancy's idea of just spelling out very clearly at the beginning that our intention and our, we is to follow the FMLA and Minnesota parenting leave laws. And then whatever happens afterwards is somewhat irrelevant. <laughs> supportive of Nancy's suggestion to um, do a third reading. I think that would be this, I know this came late and it was, it's totally appropriate to, to do that. So when we approach our action agenda, we can um, state that we'll do a third reading on 410, but we do feel ready to approve 414 harassment and violence, am I correct on that? With the changes that were suggested. Chair Waters, there was uh, one edit, I believe, from Director Casey on 414. That was the only other edit that I had for that one. If you, if you would like, um, Mary and I could take a look at, at that simple other language that we would suggest to add to this. That it, so that it is, or Anne and I, who, whoever, somebody needs to pick that up and let Cindy know, and I'm willing to do that with somebody. Are you speaking of the general policy, the change in that paragraph? Yeah, I am. 
I appreciate that offer, Nancy and Anne, to do that. And then going forward, I appreciate, Mary, that you pointed out we, we do need to read policy as school board members with multiple lenses. And um, it's, it's important work. It's why we're here. So thank you for raising that. All right. Now on our agenda, we're at the consent agenda item for it, the following items for the school board meeting of September 24th, 2018, recommended for approval. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. moved by Jim Beneke. Is there a second? Second by Mary Tombeck. All those in favor say aye. That carries 7 0. All right, heading down to our action agenda. It is item A approve. It is recommended that the school board approve the 2018 preliminary levy payable 2019 as presented. Is there a motion? Moved by Ken Morrison. Is there a second? Second by Mary Tombeck. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. That carries 7 0. Next item acceptance of gifts to the district. It is recommended that the school board approve the August donations gifts to the district in the amount of $856 as presented in the board packet. Um, is there a motion? Moved by Ann Casey. Is there a second? Second. Second by Jim Beneke. And I, I think we reiterated at some point in the future, if you feel like something needs to be spotlighted, please let Superintendent Osai know about that. So we'll take the vote. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? That carries 7-0. So our next item, the policy development, uh, second reading, policy 410 Family Medical Leave Act. We are going to put forth a third reading on that for our October 8th meeting. Um, but we are going to proceed with policy 414, harassment and violence. It is recommended that the school board approve the second reading of 414, harassment and violence as presented. Is there? Chair Waters. Yes. <laughs> Oh, it's 413 is harassment and violence. Thank you. Appreciate that, Joe. Thank you. Is there a motion to approve 413 harassment and violence as presented? Mm -hmm. Moved by Nancy. Is there a second? Second. Second, second by Ken Morrison. Any discussion? All right, hearing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? No, that carries 7-0. Here we are at communications and transmittals. Does anyone have anything to share with the community? Nancy. Well, I'm sharing it because it was right here on my desk, and unless somebody, I'm just first, so I get to talk about it, <laughs> which looks like a wonderful opportunity, and I am just so sad that I personally have a 287 board meeting that night or I'd be here. But it's, it's an opportunity on October 11th from 6.30 to 8.30, challenging racism, the Minnesota nice way. What do you say? How do you respond when you hear something and it makes your skin crawl and your stomach clench and you don't know quite how to challenge it. It sounds to me like this is gonna be an opportunity to explore those topics and, and, and learn how to do a better job of uh, standing up for the values that we hold. So it's, it's uh, facilitated by the racial equity manager of the city of St. Louis Park, Alicia Sojourner. It's Thursday, October 11th from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. at the rec center. So I hope other people are free to go and can tell me all about it and pass on the information because I have a district school board conflict. I'd like to just second that as a member of SEAC and I'm, I'm really excited for this. I know Lisa's done a ton of work to get, to get ready for this and um, Alicia's a 
fabulous facilitator. I think even just the meeting where we where we talked about planning this meeting was, was such a good meeting that I walked away with a ton of food for thought. So I think that there um, there's going to be a lot to um, a lot to take home from from this. So please um, do sign up. It is a free event, and you you need to register um, just to reserve your spot. But it is a free event. All right. Yeah. Well, and since we're talking about the way you register is you call 952-928-6442. 952-928-6442. All right. If there are no more items to communicate, is there a motion to adjourn? Moved by Mary Tombeck. Is there a second? Second by Ann Casey. All those in favor say aye. No one's opposed. That carries 7-0 at 7.58 p.m. Thank you very much, everybody.